Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, farmers, llamas and snake charmers, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel where we discuss books and little else. And you join me on a uh, schizophrenic day here in the north of England, frankly. Um, if, like most of the idiotic uh, meteorologists on the television, you like to personify the weather, um, you would describe it as not knowing what it's doing today. Um, we had a, a, a wintry flurry earlier on at about sort of 8, 9 and 10, um, which is now sort of weird sludge at the bottom of the uh, pavements, and now it's gorgeous sunshine. Um, we've been plunged into the minus temperatures, so it is particularly chilly in my living room. And um, also, uh, though many of you have <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> made it to your opinion that just because I pronounce my, uh, pronounce my H's and my T's that I'm... I don't know, some sort of uh, 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 twice departed, uh, twice removed third cousin of the Earl of Sandwich, um, that you think that I'm, you know, some sort of middle class bastion. Um, we, we are still subject to, um, you know, boilers uh, going on the blink and all sorts of, of terrible other issues. So we haven't actually got hot water in the house just now. Um, so I have made like a, um, a dude bro podcaster and have been forced to have a cold shower this morning. Um, which, I mean, they cite the um, dopaminergic positives it can have on your health and, and how it makes you more alert and more assertive and more conscientious and, and you know, more productive, yada, yada, yada. Uh, little do they know, of course, that being cold and wet is a common prerequisite and often common denominator of everybody that have died and perished. <laughs> uh, I'm not the most accomplished historian in the world, but I know that Throughout history, lots of people have died because they've been wet and cold. Uh, and so, so quite why they do these cold plunges, I don't know. But that just about covers all of my rantings uh, early this morning. Um, welcome along to Random Reviews, um, wherein we, when such uh, 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 illustrious and informative and marvellous and exciting glittering booktube events aren't on, or I haven't chosen to participate in any, um, when none such are occurring, uh, but I still want to read books and still want to talk to my friends here on YouTube, um, I shall just do a random review. They will not be random because, of course, I do indulge in TBRs and so everything is, is predetermined and preempted on this channel, so they're not random, nor are they reviews. They are either fiery exaltations or, or, or condemnations, you know, terrible bits of uh, criticism, um, but they're, they're, they're not ever so critical, as it were. Anyway, let's get into uh, this, or today's uh, book, which is uh, Virginia Woolf's Orlando, um, which features, as our uh, eponymous uh, protagonist, a epicene, pensive, dreamy, artful young man who is a close blood relative of Queen Elizabeth I of England in uh, the late 16th century um, and is a favourite of the Queen and has the, uh, you know, we, we soon are informed or it is implied by Miss Wolfe that um, he has unnatural long life and talks about the viscosity of time and how the, 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 this gentleman or, or young boy is not going to age uh, quite like his peers and everybody else. He, when the Queen Elizabeth dies and uh, King James I takes the throne, he becomes a, uh, a rather prominent and uh, rather rich favourite of King James. Again, you don't have to be um, historically accomplished to know that to be a favourite of King James was to be a uh, was to have your trousers around your ankles uh, before very long. He had um, he is one of the most famous bisexual uh, uh, people ever to have first ruled Britain and, and come from Britain, or Scotland. Um, and yes, b before long he has a uh, rather phlegmatic uh, uh, wife-to-be. He is, he is courted and has a wife-to-be, but then the, the Great Frost occurs um, in the early 17th century, and um, um, lakes are frozen over, as you might expect, um, and you know fishies that are all swimming in the lake are, are um, uh, immortalised and, uh, and kept frozen. Um, and when a party of Russians come um, from the embassy, presumably, um, he falls for a particular Muscovite countess, whom he names Sasha, uh, who is, I think, a little older. Um, and obviously, although he's promised to, I'm going to muck the name up or remember it, it's something like um, Eurifacine or Eurifacine or something. Um, although he's promised to her, he becomes uh, a little more dutiful towards Sasha and is, um, yeah, altogether more favourable of her. Um, now, there is an excellent exchange which I'm going to read out early on um, about the um, um, about just the reverence that it takes, just that, that 
fiery explosion whenever you meet somebody the like of which you've never seen before and whom you think you love and who you want to spend as much time as possible with. So that's the first section that we're going to highlight today. Um, this is when she, she's at the, at the dinner table, she's sandwiched between two lords of the realm, knights of the realm, um, whose uh, uh, French, which she speaks, is terrible. Uh, and so they're, they're not very... Um, um, they're not able not able to be loquacious because they can't speak her language essentially um, the princess was placed between two young lords one lord Francis Vere of Vere and the other young Earl of Moray it was laughable to see the predicament she soon had them in for though both were fine lads in their way the babe unborn had as, <laughs> as much knowledge of the French tongue as they had when at the beginning of dinner the princess turned to the earl and said with a grace which ravished his heart you have a French phrase which I won't even bother to pronounce or butcher um da 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 both Lord Francis and Earl showed the highest embarrassment. The one helped her largely to horseradish sauce, the other whistled to his dog and made him beg for a marrow bone. <laughs> At this, the princess could no longer contain her laughter and Orlando, catching her eyes across the boar's head and stuffed peacocks, laughed too. He laughed, but the laugh on his lips froze in wonder. Whom had he loved? What had he loved? He asked himself in a tumult of emotion until now. An old woman, he answered, all skin and bone, red-cheeked trolls, too many to mention, a puling nun, a hard-bitten... Cruel-mouthed adventurous, a nodding mass of lace and ceremony. Love had meant to him nothing but sawdust and cinders. The joys he had had of it tasted insipid in the extreme. He marvelled how he could have gone through without it, without, uh, gone through with it without yawning. And that is a, uh, uh, I'm sure, a much universal feeling amongst uh, you ladies and gentlemen watching now. Again, when you meet somebody that is just awe-inspiring and, uh, you know, sweeps you from your proverbial feet um and yeah so, so that was evoked really well by miss wolf and you know the first uh, uh commendation that i'm going to give this is that you for at least six, 70 and 80 percent of it you feel in the hands of an absolute master somebody who has um an expansive vocabulary and a sense of rhythm and has really um wrought her prose out so that it's stylistically, you know, just gorgeous to read and to, to read aloud to yourself if you're uh, uh, particularly silly and lonely enough to do so, like myself. Um, it is absolutely gorgeous and, uh, yeah, done, done, done really poetically and uh, fluently and beautifully, as I'm sure that passage uh, told you, even though I, I was rather terrible at reading it. Um, but anyway, once that fr the great frost thaws, um, the, they, it has been prearranged between Orlando and Sasha that they will um, uh, steal aboard a, a, a ship and will you know sail across and, and, and be together forever and all will be well and, and, and jolly. Uh, that doesn't happen and he is rightfully stung by that and uh, draws inwardly and becomes rather insular and a little more introspective and... Um, one of the constant allusions in this text, or, or one of the constant motifs, is um, the saviour of uh, writing and of reading. There's an excellent passage again, which I'm going to read in a moment, uh, which places reading and writing central to Orlando. He is, as we say, artistic and really very uh, adventurous um, and, yeah, yeah, quite dreamy and sometimes hypnotic. Um, and so reading and writing is a great solace for him, um, which we will also read now if I can just find the passage. Talk amongst yourselves folks. Uh, here we are. So the taste for books was an early one. As a child he was sometimes found at midnight by a page still reading. They took his, this is his servants, they took his taper away and he bred glowworms to serve his purpose. They took the glowworms away and he almost burnt the house down with a tinder. To put it in a nutshell, leaving the novelist to smooth out the crumpled silk and all its implications, he was a nobleman afflicted with a love of literature. Many people of his time, still more of his rank, escaped the infection and were thus free to run or ride or make love at their own sweet will. But some were early infected by a germ said to be bred of the pollen of the asphodel and to be blown out of Greece and Italy, which was of so deadly a nature that it would shake the hand as it was raised to strike and the and cloud the eye as it sought its prey, and make the tongue stammer as it declared its love. It was the fatal nature of this disease to substitute a phantom for reality, so that Orlando, to whom fortune had given every gift, plate, linen, houses, men servants, carpets, beds in profusion, had only to open a book for the whole vast accumulation to turn to mist. Um, and obviously you've, you've got that uh, centrality of reading there, which is remarked upon many, many times. Um, and then, once all that, he invites over uh, Nick Green, or Nicholas Green, who is a uh, recurring critic in this, seems to have 
the um, preternatural abilities like Orlando to outlive many of his peers and survives well into the early 20th century, as you'll, or, or into the 19th century, as you'll, as you'll see. Um, and yes, he writes a rather scurrilous poem about the, the, the nobleman at his table, um, and so becomes a little bit of a laughingstock, and he does what anybody does when um, they are... Uh, when they fall into public disrepute and uh, asks the uh, king to be made ambassador in Constantinople. So off he flurries and um, has a particularly long sleep during which the Turks are overthrowing the sultans and rising up. And I, I think that might be, again, historically uh, inept, that might be something to do with the Ottoman Empire, I think. Um, and then whilst he is sleeping, he awakes as a woman. Orlando becomes a woman. Um, and yeah, as I say, it's already set up, they were already set up as Christ, this is an absolute minefield. They already were set up as Epicene, and so they were, already, they were very effeminate, very effete, very uh, uh, open, you know, trait openness. And yes, yeah, so, so, now, so now Orlando is now a woman, and one of the great things that Wolf of Oak, you know, uses that as a vehicle to you know, have a look at gender to gender relations and to look at, you know, putting putting yourself in another's shoes and yeah, things of that nature, which are, uh, you know, m were much underdone. Of course, now that is um, the old sawhorse of every single writer in the 21st century, it seems. Um, I'll continue to hold the book up. Um, so yes, they, they, she sleeps through the Turkish uprising and is a woman, goes through um, with the uh, Romani gypsies and, and sort of wanders the land for a little bit and then um, is re-inspired towards nature and wants to return to England. So she returns to England and the insouciance and the indifference and the absent-mindedness really of many of her servants and the acceptance of it is um, really quite touching. They, they, they obviously, you know, this is a really, really hard book to taxonomise into genre. I mean, nowadays you could just call it a classic, but at the time I wouldn't have known what to have done with it. It is, you know, uh, mercurial and yeah, just bizarre in a really, really, you know, curious and quaint way. It's lovely. Um, but yeah, the, the, the servants essentially are very, very accepting and she's brought back in and, and continues to try to, it's called the Oak Tree, this this long pamphlet, this long uh, uh, manuscript that she's had tucked away for ages and ages. She continues to write and continues to read uh, and gets a husband and falls in love a little bit again. But that, that's, you know, I don't want to reiterate the entirety of the plot, um, but that is, you know, that is, that is it. Um, you get, they, they go through, there is a great um, historical analysis of, of three or four different periods of the Elizabethan period at the start, which is rosy, rose-tinted and cooperative and, you know, seem to be altogether positive. And then you have the Victorian era, which she lands in, um, whereby you have a, uh, what she, I think metamorphoses as a sort of, uh, growing damp um, as a, a sort of a dingy antediluvian era in which you know women are seen mainly as baby machines and have are supposed to have twenty by the time they're thirty five um, and is uh, uh, you know does does something to diminish that um, and then the, the, it goes into the twentieth century as well which is obviously the the the, the frenetic um, you know widely anonymous world that we inhabit still today pretty much um, and that's when the book starts to taper off and starts to lose it, in my opinion, because it becomes a uh, not just a stream of consciousness, but a, a, va a vast sort of glen of consciousness. It's yes, it, it, Wolf in her fiction has a temptation to do this, and because I think she suffered from an awful lot of mental health issues. First of all, this has to be said. I mean, I don't, I don't want to embellish it too much, but. Um, this, of course, is the uh, her, her friend and lover, Vita Sackville West, who has a long and complicated uh, lineage of her set of her own. Uh, and Wolf decided to this is who she dictates it to, um, and so that's a little bit of Orlando. I think I don't really know. I, d I don't like it when I have to, when a book forces you to um, just regurgitate, you know, two thirds of somebody's life in order to understand the book. In other words, when it isn't a self con a, a um, uh, a self-possessed uh, uh, artifact in and of itself when you have to refer to, oh, this is why she wrote it because of these four things in her life. In other words, it isn't self-contained. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so, yeah. 
Um, there is also an analysis of literary criticism. It's a satirical look at English history and the history of criticism. Nick Green, as, as, as I say, follows her through that. Um, initially, he it's the time of, of Shakespeare and Marlowe, and um, he detests Shakespeare and Marlowe as somebody in the employ of bookkeepers without a, an artistic bone in their body, and um, is <clears throat> rather, you know, quixotically enamoured with... Um, Cicero and, and, you know, people of the past. And then, of course, in the, uh, let me get this right, in the 19th century when it's, oh, sorry, sorry, a little bit further on when Pope and Dryden are in their pomp, he loves Shakespeare. Later on when um, Tennyson and uh, Carlyle are in their pomp and all of that lot, um, they, he then shows affection for um, Addison and Pope beforehand. And it, you can see where this is going. He is uh, the quintessential Uchronic thinker who thinks all the time that all the greats are in their graves and gives no credit to any contemporary creators, um, as is the fashion these days. And it's a, a, uh, a habit which, into which I slump very many, uh, uh, very often. Um, but yes, this is, a, this is really, really wonderful for 70 to 80 percent of it. Then the stream of consciousness and Wolf trying to give a sense of what it's like to have some sort of split personality and to be mentally deranged sometimes um, and just the the, the um, rapidity of you know different personalities swishing in and out between you that's never going to be a really very easy thing to uh, get across on the page but nonetheless Wolf does a decent job of it it's um, yeah as it's quite self-referential it does it's got that breaking of the fourth wall much like Mr Trollope likes to do um, doesn't do it quite as successfully, but, you know, for example, the, the, the opening is uh, uh, very, very like that. Um, da -da 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 -da. It talks about... Uh, anyway, I'm not going to mention that because I'm not going to be able to find it. But yeah, I've got a few more sections that I wanted to highlight, but this video is already long enough. Um, but yeah, this was jolly good. I don't quite know because it's obviously going to be a darling of um, the ideologically captured institutions that want to um, perpetuate the uh, challenged and contestable school of thought that gender fluidity has some sort of scientific validity to it. I don't know how it's not more known. Um, Wolf herself sort of hands over the um, validity of transgenderism or moving from a man to a woman, hands that topic and concept over to the historians and the philosophers, as she says herself, she doesn't want to um, weigh in on, on, on moving from a man to a woman because such a practice or, or such a practice that was, yeah, was, was, was really not um, um, very common in her time, as I'm sure you're all too aware of. But yes, that I think just about covers this review. I have waffled on about not an awful lot in particular, but um, hopefully it was helpful for you. I would highly recommend it. It's reasonably short, a couple of days read at most. Um, and is couched in the most beautiful prose possible. It's, it's I could say, for 70 to 80 percent of it, before the 20th century, when the uh, frenetic daily life and motor cars come into it, and she goes to stores and buys commodities. Until that point, it's really, really good and very thought-provoking, and a uh, the proverbial rollicking good read. Um, but yes, I think that just about covers it for today. I'm now going to go on a bracing walk in the minus temperatures and um, purchase a newspaper slash. Uh, newsletter for um, my political video which will go out tomorrow. But yes, thank you ever so much for watching BookTube and goodbye.